My name is Tamalee Nenek, and I'm an Extension Dairy Specialist in the Department of Animal Sciences at Purdue University. Today we're going to be talking about mycotoxin in dairy diets. Mycotoxins are poisonous substances naturally produced by molds. Molds and mycotoxins can be produced at a variety of times. So when you're handling grains or other feed products, you need to be aware of what you're doing with those feed products, both pre-harvest, during transportation, during processing, and especially during storage. There are a wide variety of mycotoxins that are problems with different feedstuffs. Some of the common mycotoxins include aflatoxins, deoxynovelanol, which we refer to as DON, zurelanone, fumonisin, and T2. There are a variety of symptoms of mycotoxins in dairy cows. Some of the symptoms that you might see in your dairy herd may include reduced feed intake, reduced milk production, reduced milk fat production, looser variable feces, reproductive issues, and impaired immune functions, which might be seen in increasing somatic cell counts, and a variety of other things. One thing to keep in mind is that the symptoms of mycotoxins are not very specific. So as you may see on this slide, there are a wide variety of, of symptoms, but in a lot of cases with mycotoxins, there's nothing very specific. I'd like to talk about a few specific mycotoxins that we often see in dairy cattle diets and are concerned with. First of all, I'd like to talk about aflatoxin. Aflatoxins usually come from the mold Aspergillus flavus. Aflatoxins are more common in situations where there is heat and drought conditions that are more common in warm and humid climates, in conditions that are common in places such as the southeastern United States. One of the problems with the aflatoxins is they can be transferred to milk. From the dietary standpoint, there are limits on aflatoxins and aflatoxin should be limited to 20 parts per billion in dairy cattle diets. Another thing to keep in mind is that there is a maximum limit in the amount of aflatoxin that can be sold in milk. When aflatoxins get above 0.5 parts per billion in milk, that milk can no longer be sold and will, it will have to be dumped. The next mycotoxin I'd like to talk about is Don. Don is a fusarium produced mycotoxin. A lot of the time, Don is referred to as a vomitoxin because in monogastric animals such as swine, it can actually induce vomiting. When we talk about dairy cattle, USDA feeding recommendations for dairy cattle is less than five parts per million of Don in grains, which we would figure to be about two parts per million in finished feedstuffs. When we talk about the levels in research studies that we've seen fed, we've seen some very mixed results. Some studies have shown that diets with 2.5 parts per million to 6.5 parts per million of deoxynovalanol have shown reduced milk production. However, in other studies, Don has been fed at levels of six parts per million for three weeks without any negative effects. On the conservative recommendation standpoint, if the levels are 300 to 500 parts per billion, they should be safe to feed. One thing to notice is that these dietary recommendations are in parts per billion. Oftentimes, when you receive your feed analysis, they will be reported in parts per million. So it's important for you to observe the units of the sample analysis. The next mycotoxin we're going to cover is zuralanone. Zuralanone is also a fusarium produced mycotoxin. One thing to know about zuralanone is that it can produce estrogenic responses in animals. Thus, it can interfere with reproduction. There are no USDA standards for zuralanone, and we have seen differences in research studies. The conservative feeding recommendations is 200 to 300 parts per billion of zuralanone in the diet because we have seen negative effects at 400 parts per billion. There are some strategies that producers can do to minimize the risk of mycotoxins in their feed. One of these things you can do is to properly store silages. Some things to keep in mind if you are harvesting silages is to make sure you harvest them at correct moisture levels. Also be sure to pack correctly to remove all the oxygen from the feed. The next thing you want to make sure to do is that cover that silo or bunker as soon as possible to prevent oxygen from reaching the top. And finally, when you are feeding that silage, make sure you're feeding it at a rate to prevent molding from occurring on the face. When we talk about storing grains and dry feeds, make sure you're storing them at low moisture levels to prevent mold growth. We would like to keep the moisture levels at less than 15% moisture and preferably in that 10 to 12% range. Another thing to consider if you do have mycotoxins in your feeds are binders. Binders may offer some short-term relief in situations where there are some mycotoxins present. There are several kinds of binders that are available. There are kind of two overall classes of binders, including inorganic binders and organic adsorbents. Some of the inorganic binders you might hear about are bentonite, zeolite, aluminosilicates, and diatomaceous earth. 
some organic absorbents are wheat bran, yeast cell walls, and cellulose. When you're talking about binders, you need to make sure that you find a binder that has been shown to work for the mycotoxin you're concerned with, because different binders have been shown to work better for certain mycotoxins. For an example, activated charcoal may bind xerelinone and Dawn, but they haven't been shown to work that well in aflatoxins. On the other hand, clay-based binders have been shown to reduce aflatoxin, as did a hydrated sodium calcium aluminosilicate. However, those clay-based binders do not work as well with xerelinone or with Dawn. If you are using an organic absorbent as a binder, be sure that the binder is specific to the mycotoxin of concern and that desorption does not occur. When you are considering a binder, there are some characteristics you need to keep in mind. First of all, binders should be effective at low inclusion rates. They need to be stable at a wide range of pH, especially if you're including silages in your ration. And they should be able to act before the mycotoxin is absorbed into the bloodstream in order to make sure they're actually going to help. Keep in mind with binders, there are a variety of products available. And research is important to verify the efficacy of the product. If you are concerned about the presence of mycotoxins in your feeds, it's important to have your feeds tested. In order to test your feeds, first of all, make sure to collect a representative sample. After you collect that sample, make sure it is stored properly before it is sent to the laboratory. There are several ways you can store the sample. First of all, you can dry it or you can freeze it. Another option would be to put a mold inhibitor on the sample to make sure there is no further mold growth. Next, send the sample to a certified laboratory for analysis. There are a wide variety of laboratories from which you can send your samples. One option would be to send your sample to the, to the Animal Disease and Diagnostic Laboratory at Purdue University, or otherwise you can also use a wide variety of commercial laboratories. In conclusion, if you'd like additional information, feel free to contact me at the email listed on the screen. Some other good sources of information is the Plant Disease Information website at Purdue University, shown here at this website. There's also an excellent publication available through eExtension on mold and mycotoxin issues in dairy cattle. This presentation was a production of the Animal Science Department at Purdue University.